um, special seminar by Kerry Moore, George Seminar. Uh, I think Kerry does require introduction. I mean, everyone in this room, I assume, or most people know him. I mean, Kerry has been the director of the George Institute over the past five years, and this is his last seminar with us. He's going to other places, to uh, Australia. I mean, over the past five years, Kerry and I have worked very closely with each other on multiple levels, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. Um, and uh, I know of his uh, keen interest in pushing the scientific boundaries, and he's one of the few people who has looked at epidemiology from the time when epidemiology was still um, sort of a new term, a new discipline being developed, working with Richard Dahl, and has continued the tra trajectory of epidemiology, taking similar approaches and advancing over time. And here, this talk, he will talk um, mainly about the life course epidemiology, looking at some of the, uh, our understanding of cardiovascular risk factors and what impact they're having early in, in detection in early life on uh, adulthood, I guess. Um, so thank you, Terry, and over to you. Thank you, Kasim, and uh, it's very nice to see so many people here from uh, this place who I've worked with and nice to have the chance to present something to you which uh, I think is important. And I don't know everyone here, so nice to see those I, I don't know well anyway, even if I've seen them before. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this topic, uh, which is something I have been interested in and working on in one way or another over more than 40 years. Now that suggests I think this topic is important uh, and I hope by the end of this talk I will have convinced you that it is somewhat important. I might say it's not at the centre uh, of research interest in the cardiovascular field. Um, I hope the evidence I present to you today suggests to you that maybe it should be treated with a little more importance. I might say that I just got here and I only received this this afternoon from the... Uh, European Society of Cardiology Congress, which is in conjunction with the World Congress of Cardiology to be held in Paris in uh, September, where I'll be talking on just what I'm talking to you about today, and uh, the press release starts off, this is the first reliable evidence of a link between major cardiovascular risk factors in children and cardiovascular disease in adults is presented today at the ESC. Well, it's presented ahead of the ESC here, and this is the first time this evidence has been presented anywhere in the world, and there is no comparable evidence from other studies. So, um, what do I mean when I say, for those who aren't cardiovascular disease researchers, major cardiovascular disease events, what, what I'm talking about principally are myocardial infarcts or heart attacks or strokes. And most of those have as an underlying process uh, this disorder of the artery. The, the arteries take oxygenated blood to tissues, important tissues like the brain, and if they're interrupted, a stroke occurs, if it's an artery going to the heart, then a uh, heart attack occurs, and I'll, I'll use that term, even though it's, um, it's a more general term. Uh, and the, if, uh, if they're blocked, then the tissue beyond them dies. So what blocks them? Well, this process, I'll use the pointer here, fairly ineffectually. This process called atherosclerosis, which is a, a mix of cholesterol, other lipids, fibrous tissue that builds up over time, comes to turn what was otherwise a nice, smooth, round inner part of this tube into something that looks distorted like that. And although that alone doesn't lead to the blockage in most cases, bits can break off, the, the, what's called the plaque can rupture, and all of a sudden there's a clot that forms that completely blocks the artery and, and causes an immediate problem, which is manifest as a heart attack or a stroke. So what do we, know? We, do, we do know about what to do when it occurs. People have been going actually to coronary care units. I remember uh, writing a paper on this and presenting it to a heart association meeting in Australia back in the late 70s, the, the benefit of coronary care units. We know how to treat, for example, a, 
uh, a heart attack. Uh, but what about preventing it? Well, what we know what we know about is derived almost entirely from studies of middle-aged adults. And what we know is if you measure in these middle-aged adults, take blood and measure cholesterol in particular, you can measure other things of importance, and blood pressure, what you find is that if you wait for these middle-aged individuals to have a cardiovascular disease event, you find that cholesterol and blood, serum cholesterol and blood pressure relate directly and strongly to the risk of having an event. And if, you in, if intervention is undertaken, if this is, their high levels are determined through screening and intervention takes place with medication or lifestyle, the risk can be reduced, and substantially, by about 50%. So this is very, very important to know, and this is where all the focus is at the moment. So we know this. We know that risk factor lowering in adulthood is effective. This is actually a diagram I put together. Those who think my pic pictorial skills are limited are probably correct, and I did not go into, uh, into art for that reason. But what this is meant to show is that this atherosclerosis develops over time, and it's part of the uh, process that leads to an event occurring. Now. But what if an even greater risk reduction could be achieved by earlier intervention? What would, uh, and if we look, for example, at the current um, uh, cardiovascular disease event rates or mortality rates in the UK or the US and compare them to the lowest rates in the world, which are in countries like Japan, uh, the event rate is actually much less than a half. So that somehow or other they've got to that point uh, and uh, so what if, what if it was possible to get down well below 50% through intervening earlier and why would we think it might be? Well, one of the reasons is that atherosclerosis itself starts in childhood. That, that damage to the artery starts very early, before the age of 10 in many people. And I'll give you an idea of the, the real um, uh, prevalence of this in a minute. So the question has to be asked, if we intervene then, would it have a greater effect? Let me just use the arrow here. If we intervened here, would it have a greater effect than if we intervened there? And this is how prevalent um, the, the, that, those raised lesions I showed in the, the slide of the atherosclerotic artery are called plaques. And this slide here is a, a slide preventing, presenting data from a study in Louisiana, which started in 1973. It involved 12,000 children, and those 12,000 children were followed and still being followed. But many died in their 20s of accidents, homicides, suicides, and the study had permission to do autopsies and look at their arteries. And they were able to identify back in 1998, so 25 years after the study started, uh, 204 children who had died of these other causes and look at their coronary arteries and they found evidence of plaques which are the raised lesions. Fatty streaks are the earlier um, the deposition of cholesterol, like cholesterol that occurs before plaques. They're able to find, you can see here, in two to 15 year olds, it, it's not, it's hard to get the exact percent from this isn't it, but it's, it's going to be something like more than five percent but by 16 to 20, almost 40% of individuals in this United States sample from the 1970s had lesions, and of course it goes up to almost 80% in those 26 to 39. So certainly these lesions that are relevant are present uh, and need to be considered. The other thing this study showed uh, in a New England Journal paper was that and because it, this study that started in 73, as well as following those individuals, did measures of their uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors in childhood, was able, they were able to link the data on risk factors in childhood with, um, with the presence of these, uh, these lesions in the coronary arteries. And you can see there, if you look at it, that for those who had three or four risk factors, and the, the four risk factors that they had were serum cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking and body mass index. So a person who had at least three of those, you can see from that, had about 20 times the, the 
at least the coverage of the arteries with these plaques. That's, that's what's measured there. So this is fairly good evidence that what's happening in childhood is relevant to these lesions that uh, occur early and are quite prevalent. So should we be starting to prevent coronary heart disease and, and stroke and would it be valuable if we started earlier? Should these little children here, instead of sitting in their mother's uh, cart as she goes around the shopping centre pulling off ice creams from the shelves and other things which I've seen little children like this do and take them home, should we be thinking harder about what we do to prevent future cardiovascular disease in them? Well, any any um, consideration of that kind requires evidence. And the sort of evidence that's needed to know whether we should really think seriously about earlier intervention are studies of this kind that either start in pregnancy or at birth with measurements, or in childhood, just a little later, and follow the, the participants until they have their event. Well, that would be the sort of evidence we need. To this point, uh, there is some evidence from studies of birth weight in particular and later cardiovascular disease events showing that smaller babies have a higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease events. Uh, I might say also a, uh, a lower risk of cancer, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, they, in terms of studies of children with anything like the types of uh, uh, measures that I've indicated with this slide where, for example, blood's taken and serum cholesterol might be measured or blood pressure measured. To this point, there is no evidence at all. And uh, if you want to think about why that might be, uh, the follow-up period for a study of that kind after the measurements are taken is going to be of the order of 40 years at least, someone until the individuals reach, uh, say, at least 50, where cardiovascular disease events start to become somewhat common and, and increasingly common uh, as the, the next few years go by. Um, who's going to start a study to, that's going to take 40 years? And, of course, I'm going to tell you that I know some people who have done something like that, but if you think of doing it now, if I suggested at the George to the, uh, the team here that I had an idea for a study that would take 40 years, even if they thought it was worth investing their lifetime of research in it, they'd know that if we put in an application to the Wellcome or MRC, they would think this was a highly risky endeavour. Um, you know, would it, would it realise what it was supposed to? Would we be able to recruit the children? Would we get it through ethics? Would it be the case that we'd be able to follow them long enough to even find out what happened to them? All those sorts of issues. And would the knowledge have been derived in some other way by the time that uh, the study had been completed? So this is, this is why such studies haven't been done. All that has been done is what I'll call the, the easy work. That is following um, children, or in this case, this is an Israeli study of, of conscripts measured the year before they go into the army, 17-year-olds who've had height and weight measured. There are many studies like this. Some use school measurements of height and weight. Many countries measure height and weight at some point on children, and it's possible to link that uh, the, the estimation of uh, adiposity through uh, looking at the body mass index, uh, which is weight in kilos over height in metres meter squared, and this is what they've done. They've looked at body mass index at age 17, followed the participants. They had something like 1.7 million of them for, uh, for another 40 years, and you can see there when you look at it that the, um, the children in the top or the participants in the top, uh, above the 95th percentile, probably is not quite so even what the ratio is, but I've had a look at the page. It's about four. Those in the 95th percentile have about um, four times the risk of those in the bottom quarter. So how, how was one to get around this? Well, one thing that did happen 40 years ago was that Cohort studies with measurements of cardiovascular disease risk factors were initiated. I was around in America at this time. Um, 
when the, the, the first really successful study of lowering serum cholesterol and seeing whether that lowered the risk of events was conducted and funded by the National Institutes of Health there. And uh, at that time, people were getting interested because they knew that it was important. They were getting interested in whether serum cholesterol was distributed in a way where it seemed to be high in children or blood pressure was high. And uh, a number of studies were started. So the first of these was the Muscatine study in Iowa. Uh, it was started in 1970 and had 11,000 odd participants. And these are children roughly of school age. Vogelusa heart study I mentioned before in New Orleans, uh, or just out of New Orleans, 12,000 participants starting in 73. Uh, in Minneapolis, there were around 2,000 participants in a study. Uh, and these Princeton sounds as though it should be Princeton University, doesn't it? But it's not. It's a, it's a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. But, so these two studies were in Ohio, in Cincinnati. The Finns, who were very interested in cardiovascular disease at this time, because just prior to that, Finland had the highest rate of uh, coronary heart disease and, and uh, myocardial infarcts in the world. And CEDAR is uh, the Childhood Determinants of Adult Health Study in Australia, uh, recruited 8,500 participants in 85. And this was a study that I designed and, and ran, ran back in 1985 and, and, late, and continued on with later. So just to summarise, there, were, there was data collection between 1970 and 1985 on about 40,000 participants, child participants. And all of these studies collected data on height, weight, other measures like girths, took bloods for serum cholesterol and other lipids, measured blood pressure and collected data on lifestyle, which includes smoking, diet and physical activity. This is just to show real children having the measures. I actually couldn't find uh, photos of them having blood pressure or blood taken uh, in my searches over the recent weeks. But this is from the Australian study. These are children who participated. I was actually taken by how skinny the kids were, but maybe that's how skinny <laughs> kids are. They just they look leaner than I, and they probably are leaner than than they would be now. And this is uh, I remember this period too. The the adult, young adult follow-up. So 20 years later, we were able to follow up those 8,500 participants, at least over 5,000 of them, and do the same measurements again. And this is the pattern across those um, seven or eight cohorts. I say seven or eight because there were, there were some additions, small additions made in terms of cohorts in, uh, in Cincinnati after the, the initial scan we did. And uh, they all did this. They all had childhood measurements, they all had young adult measures. So they had really quite a rich database to work on that could potentially address the question that I'm addressing today. And in around 1999, 2000, I decided I'd apply to an Australian, the equivalent of the MRC here, to get money to follow up the Australian cohort with the express purpose of following them for events. But I would have had to exaggerate a great deal to tell the uh, National Health and Medical Research Council reviewers that I would have had an answer in, say, 10 years if I did that. But I realised if I brought in these other studies and I knew colleagues in the bigger ones and we pooled our resources, we could get there in half the time. So back in 2000, I managed to get a grant to follow up the Australian cohort and I wrote to Bogalusa and Gerald Berenson, the head there, I wrote to Ron Lauer in, uh, in Iowa, in Muscatine, and I wrote to the Young Finns. And two of them wrote back enthusiastically. I later found out that Ron Lauer had, uh, was seriously ill and no longer working, so I didn't hear from them for a few years to come. And then in 2009, we, um, we had a meeting. We decided to have the first formal meeting of the group in New Orleans. We worked together. We'd been publishing papers mainly on just comparing the risk factors across the cohorts. Um, I just I put this up to give you an idea, because one of the interesting features of this work is if you work on something for 40 years, a lot more goes on than if you work on it for a, a three-year funded research project. This is Gerald Berenson. Uh, he died last year, late last year, at 98. Um, at that point, he was uh, 88. <laughs> 
and uh, the senior member of the team, very lively character, and I have written an in memoriam for him which was published in, uh, with support of my colleagues in the group, but it was published in the journal Hypertension just a couple of months ago. So it is, and it's a, his is an interesting story. Other people there that are important, gives you an idea, I think, of how you get these big, long projects to, to be funded and work. The woman next to him in the blue is Kashil Jakish, and she's the program officer at NHLBI who, since that time, has been supporting us to, to finish this work and get a grant, which we knew was just essential. If we were going to follow all the cohorts, although Finland and Australia wouldn't be terribly difficult to get follow-up information on events or deaths, in America, it's just awfully difficult. You need to go back to the individuals. The cost of doing each piece of work in America, I'm sure there are some here who work there, but it's just so much more. I think we worked out when we compared it to Australia, it was at least three to four, four dollars for every dollar we would have spent. It's partly because the researchers are paid through the grants as well as collecting the data. But we knew we had to do it. We had to get an American research grant and the program officer helped us. She couldn't influence the reviewers, but she helped us. Uh, and along the way, as we built up the um, we built up the case, we did work on, um, for example, early atherosclerosis in the arteries. We could measure the carotid arteries. We published what we could. New England Journal of Medicine paper looking at what happens to children who are overweight, who lose weight between childhood and adulthood. What happens to their metabolic syndrome, risk factors. Uh, what happens to the thickness of their carotid arteries. And this is what we presented to the, the uh, NHLBI grants committee for what's called NARO1. And this is, this is what I'm going to use just to show you what, um, what we're looking at in terms of the design of this study. This is, what this, is, this shows you, and it is a bit complicated, I know, these are all the individual cohorts. And this is when measurements were made in those cohorts. You can see these are in childhood because the age axis is up here. And these measurements here in adulthood. What you can see is the measurements weren't all made at exactly the same time in every study. But they covered the range of ages. Uh, generally, there were repeat measures along the way. And our goal was to follow them to this point. And I'm now going to get to the point where we look at the data we've collected. Uh, by the end of 2019, the grant came in. We were funded for five years from the beginning of 2015 to just at the beginning of 2020. So we've got about six months left on this grant. And uh, fortunately, it's gone pretty much as we predicted. Um, and I'll tell you how, what I mean by that. So we started off with 40,000 children with measures. Uh, we went back to remeasure them and get permission to, particularly the American participants, to go and investigate their hospital records and any other relevant re medical records to identify um, cardiovascular disease events. And uh, we, here it says we were able to recontact 17,500. In fact, by the time we've finished, given the trajectory, and I don't have that up there, we'll have just over 20,000, about 21,000 that we've uh, recontacted, so about half the original. Um, and to this point, we have what are called 290 adjudicated events, and that's what I'm going to show you the data from. In fact, we have more than that in terms of what we would call highly probable events. We, we've had we all the individuals we recontacted gave us self reports on what they'd experienced, and we've linked their self reports to adjudicated event status. An adjudicated event is where there is actually the medical information from hospitals and the doctors. And we've had um, cardiologists come and look at that information and decide whether it's sufficient to say a person definitely had a myocardial infarct or a stroke. That's an adjudicated event. We've linked that to what the people have said about their own experiences, their own experience of an event. And for about another 150 of those at the moment, we have a group of highly probable who are about 90% likely to be, have been adjudicated positive, who will include in the final numbers. It's often the case in this sort of epidemiological study, you do that. Uh, and all up at the end, we, we, we put in our original grant, we expected we would have 660 events. We think at the moment we'll have about 700 events. So what you're going to see is information on 290, 
You'll notice I've got in there deaths, which is the number of deaths from the whole 42,000 we started with. So we are going to be look at, able to look at deaths. Uh, if there's any bias in the, the fact that we're only able to follow half of them for cardiovascular events, we'll look at it in the deaths where deaths are available for everyone in each country. So that will be complete. And there'll be a large number of deaths, although only a, a proportion of them, probably a quarter to a third, will be CVD. So on the 290 deaths, what have we found? This is the, the key data, the key findings. Um, and again, on just the 290, so you know, these days where big data gives us thousands of events, looking at 290 events, some people think might not be enough. Well, you can make up your own mind at this point. We will, um, we will of course, be looking at more precise estimates with the large number of events by the end of the year. So w what we see here is the association, it's presented as, we're, we're looking here at hazard ratios, but the, the units of measurement when we see this 1.43 for body mass index. This is the increase in risk associated with one standard deviation of the measure. So these are called standardised coefficients. Why are they used? Uh, Mark Woodward said to me, because we're talking about whether there would be better ways of doing it. He said, oh, the Americans love these standardised coefficients. I don't, I'm not so keen. These have been prepared by an analysis team in, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, and, and what they think when people present standardised coefficients, in the main they use them because they think they make unlike measures easy to compare. So if you divide each measure by its variability, you get an idea of how one measure might compare to another. So for the moment, I'm, I'm going to show you percentage changes in a minute, but let's just start with these so you can have a look and see. This, these are fairly, uh, even already, fairly narrow confidence limits for these around these standard, standardised coefficients. Uh, for body mass index, 1.43, 1.35 for cholesterol, you can see it all. Triglycerides, uh, looks as though it's a significant finding. Blood pressure, on, and with these measures, it looks to be having a similar effect to cholesterol and body mass index. Smoked in youth looks to be a bigger effect, but don't be um, fooled by that data. This one is not a standardised coefficient. This is just yes or no. Did, did the individual smoke in youth or not? So this is the whole effect, whereas the others are for a one unit change. HDL cholesterol, uh, you can see a protective effect. Not much for glucose and insulin, but if you look at the numbers, you can see that when we get away from the major risk factors, we start to get into relatively small numbers. It's interesting that nonetheless, the associations for HDL cholesterol there, confidence limits don't embrace one. Now, I'm going to just show you a few things we asked of the data. We haven't asked everything yet. This is quite a, only very recently we've had the, this information on 290 events. Um, first of all, we had debates w among us about whether the effect in young children would be, or the association would be greater than among teenagers. One of our colleagues in Minneapolis, a, a paediatric endocrinologist said he was absolutely sure the associations would be stronger for teenagers than for young children. Others among us said, well, you know, if childhood's important, maybe the earlier, the, the bigger the effect. So looking at this, the way it's set up, and I thank Jeff Herr, who's here today, who made these nice graphs for me. Um, you can see looking at, at these that the, the way they're set up is the blue represent the young children, and the yellow, the older children. And for if the pairs of two are uh, related to these risk factors here. And I think without spending too much time on it, you can see that um, really the associations look about the same. It doesn't look as though there's a difference for the younger and the older children. Smoking, you'll note there's no younger children smoking data and that's because we had hardly any children 10 and under who were smoking, so we couldn't estimate that. This one, I put this up because the George Institute is uh, very interested, I, I'm interested, but I know there are a lot of people here interested in uh, the differences for males and females. It's set up in the same way as the, the uh, other forest plot before, where the uh, males are in blue, females in yellow. We thought blue and pink would be just a bit too too unacceptable. And so uh, 
this is what we have here. And if you go through them the same way, looking at body mass index, so the first two, and the next two are cholesterol and so on, it does look, doesn't it, as though the, the female associations are a bit stronger. You know, we're, at the moment, when you, if you look at the top, you'll see that the, for the males, there are 176 cases we had, and for the females, fewer. This is because females do have a lower event rate. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's interesting data, and maybe when we have 700 events and we look at the deaths as well, uh, this might become a firmer finding. Now, I said I'd, I'd present the hazard ratios not as standard deviates, but as percentages. And the reason I want to do that, some of my colleagues don't like the idea at all, is that I think it's very difficult to start thinking about interventions talking about standard deviates. So, you know, you say, look, uh, we, could get, we could get this reduction, this much of a standard deviate reduction in blood pressure if we gave people these tablets. It's not quite the same as saying, well, we'd, we'd lower blood pressure by this number of millimetres or we'd lower blood pressure by this percent. I've used percentages because a lot of the adult cohort data is using percentage estimates to estimate how much a, a difference in serum cholesterol would mean to event rates, in percentage difference, and how much a difference in blood pressure in percent would, would uh, be related to differences in event rates. So here you can see that for a 10% increase in body mass index, you'd get a 20% increase in, uh, that's what a hazard ratio of 1.20 implies, a 20% increase uh, in uh, risk of an event for total cholesterol, 16%. And for blood pressure, you can see that when you present the data this way, rather than the standard deviates, systolic blood pressure looks as though it might be the most important and the most important opportunity for intervention. Smoking remains as before because, again, we're not looking at percentage changes. We're looking just at smoking or not. It's just the same figure. Oh, by the way, how does that compare? Most of the adult um, cohort data suggests for a 1% increase in the risk factor particularly, well, at least for cholesterol and blood pressure, about a 2% increase in risk of the event, so it doesn't look very different. Generally, they adjust for regression dilution bias and come up with a, a, a 3 to 1 ratio. Blood pressure effect there looks fairly big. The next question we asked was, is there a, and I'll, I'll try to explain this clearly to you, what, first of all, what are the numbers? Well, this is the number of events and the number of participants in that category. There's only about 6,000 participants in this because for an individual to be in the data analysis, they had to have both child and adult data. And so out of the, those we already had, which was on a subset of those we've followed anyway, uh, we, uh, we only had about 150 who had this data. So that's why if you add the numbers up here, you'll see it's only about 150 events. And what we're looking at here is, uh, it's not really prevalence, it's risk of, it's the, the percentage who, who uh, suffered the, the, uh, the event. So that's a risk. And the way it's set up is along this axis here, we're looking at the adult risk level. Did an individual have no risk factors, one or two or more risk factors? And these coloured um, blocks here re reflect the childhood level of risk. So these people are individuals who in adulthood didn't have risk factors, but in childhood these individuals here had two or more risk factors. These had none. And then the same here for those adults who had two or more risk factors, these were those who also as children had two or more risk factors. There are various ways, this is quite a, this business of separating out childhood risk from adult risk is statistically more complex than at first seems and we've chosen to look at it in this relatively simple way, uh, which we think adequately does separate the two effects and the interpretation of this data is that there does seem to be an extra effect from childhood. It's not just an, if it was just an adult effect, then you wouldn't have these much higher rates. So when the adult risk level is held constant, you wouldn't have the higher levels of uh, events in those who had the high levels of childhood risk factors. So this is probably quite important. And if it's sustained as we get two and three times as many events, it'll become more important. 
Now finally, and I'm showing you this not because it's my favourite forest plot, but I think it would be incomplete not to do it. If we put all the risk factors we had into the one model, this is what comes out. Body mass index, the association is reduced by about a quarter. Total cholesterol by about a half. Triglycerides disappear. Systolic blood pressure by about a half. You smoking is not affected. It seems it's quite independent of those other risk factors. And you can see male sex. So the reason I'm not so keen on this yet is because we haven't done a lot of thinking about causal pathways and what we should include in the model. And all of those who done recent epidemiology courses would know that we should be thinking hard about that and constructing our DAGs and we're in the process of doing that. So th this, this is not the final um, model we will arrive at but that's what happens if you do it very crudely. Now just to reach the conclusion of my talk, um, why, I mean if what I've shown you is true and we know that there are children out there who will have risk factors. This is a very evident one we can see from outside. I might say for those who are from um, an Asian background, this, you can't see it there, can you? This is actually taken in, in East Asia. So it's not, this is not just a Western slide. This is happening across the world. Why aren't we doing more if it's true that what's happening in childhood is conferring an extra risk beyond what we can remove in adulthood. So what this implies is that we are, by not doing anything, a parent, a school, a society, is actually leaving a child with a residual risk that can't completely be removed. So when the parent allows the child to pull off the supermarket shelf the ice cream and put it in the supermarket basket and take it home and eat it, uh, it might be having an impact on the child. That's what our, the first look at this da our data suggests. Not confirmed yet, but it's, it's highly suggestive. So why, why aren't we doing more? And I'll give you an example of what's happening in Britain at the moment. Well, I mean, the first thing is, I think quite reasonably, I used to be on Heart Foundation committees in Australia and this would come up as a topic and the answer would always be, we can't put much effort into this yet because the evidence is too poor. It's circumstantial. There is no direct evidence that childhood risk factors related to the risk of an adult uh, event. And so they, they argue they need better evidence. Un unfortunately, there won't be a lot of the kind I'm showing you those studies, those cohort studies we included, they're it. They're the only ones of a thousand or more participants that measured all those key, those major risk factors, serum cholesterol, blood pressure, BMI and smoking, that exist. So there, there won't be a parallel study that will repeat what we've got. All that will happen is we'll get more and more events over time. Um, and the strengths and weaknesses of the study will be analysed and, and uh, tested the other problem is that it's not just that the evidence isn't so strong, it's just, you know, what do you do? Sort of things you would do to reduce BMI and serum cholesterol, for example, are uh, to maybe have programs that change uh, nutritional intake. Things like school, I mean, back in, I remember back in Australia when my wife and I returned from America, she used to try and urge uh, the, in Australia, the, the, um, where the children get their food is called a tuck shop and she used to urge the others there to not buy unhealthy foods and only give the children healthy foods. I don't think, I think almost, almost no progress has been made in that because it's difficult and it's difficult to change food intake, particularly when children are so keen on eating, uh, eating the things they like the taste of. Physical activity programs are another option, particularly for BMI. And what about tablets? You know, that's what we do with adults. Um, we put adults on antihypertensive uh, tablets. We put them on statins to lower their cholesterol and, and other agents. Is that an option for children? In preparing this, someone said to me, I won't say who, when, surely we're not going to give children tablets. And I said, well, the most recent estimate I saw was that 5% of primary school boys were on amphetamines at the moment for ADHD. People will give kids tablets if that's, that's what the doctors tell them to do. The doctors 
possibly you should or should not do that, it will be much more easily, um, it, it will be a recommendation that will be much more readily taken up in the United States where uh, the people who are working on this study with me now are thinking about recommendations for medicating children. So those are options that are, are on the table. Um, I won't say what I think is the best option because we haven't done any analyses of cost effectiveness and, and the ethics of that at this point. But I mean, am I right to say that we're not doing much at the moment? Well, this is England's current policy on something I know quite a bit about, so I'm prepared to put up what, um, what, what the current approach is. And so this is, the, this is what's said. Um, whilst children spend a significant, significant amount of time in school, I might say six hours a day, five days a week, 40 weeks a year for 12 years, meaning, somewhat meaningful, uh, they say keeping children active is a shared responsibility and parents and carers need to play their part. Well, I think that's wise. It's um, prudent. It's not very strong, though. And the government has given, and I'm not, this is not a plea for money at all. Not, the, the, my work's not in this, this intervention field at the moment, it's more in providing the evidence. $40 million, ah, dollars, I said that the other day, $40 million pounds, uh, for a national program, which probably is um, for 20 million children, so $2 a child. I don't know whether any, I'm sure that there are people here who've worked um, more intensively on costs of health care than I have. Uh, the check I did prior to this talk was that each year in England more than $10 billion a year is spent on the treatment of cardiovascular disease in the health system, let alone other costs. So the question is, what's a reasonable amount to put into this? And again, this is the sort of discussion that will come after the evidence is presented and that there'll be a balancing of the quality of the evidence, what it, how important it is and what the what the opportunities might be to change. I mean, no point saying we'll intervene if the intervention won't work and how much it will cost. Now, finally, uh, the you might imagine if, if what I've said is true, if the only collection of data of this kind, and I haven't even shown you the data on diet and physical activity, the, the, the psychological data on how children feel about themselves, the storage of uh, biospecimens, of which there are about 12,000 stored biospecimens, how important it might be as a resource for more than just cardiovascular disease, as well as many other studies on cardiovascular disease beyond the one that we have conducted. Um, we've put in a grant renewal to NIH. They, they gave us 13 million for the, the last five years. We've put in for a similar amount. They are demanding that we have a program to enable people to conduct what are called ancillary studies, which is like applying to UK Biobank for data to, um, to uh, analyse it and, and address, it, address hypotheses, and, and we will do that. There will be many, many ideas that will come for the use of this data beyond what we've already done and are doing at the moment, remembering that if we do nothing more with the current data collection but just follow people, over time, the number of events will go up exponentially, and that will be of value in our answering the questions that we have. We do have a grant application under preparation to study adult cancer. Um, again, there's virtually nothing from childhood. Um, we know, for example, that for premenopausal breast cancer, there is a surprising <coughs> neg negative association between body mass index and uh, Occurrence, that is, the girls who are more overweight before adolescence and during adolescence are less likely to get premenopausal breast cancer, but it's all based on height and weight measures. There are no measures of other uh, more direct measures of adiposity that you saw in one of the slides I had where skin folds were being measured and girths, uh, and there are no concurrent measures of hormones in those girls which might be highly relevant to. Uh, sex and growth hormones to occurrence of the cancer. So, and as it happens, uh, our estimate and our previous estimates for CVD were pretty, pretty good. We estimate there have already been about 500 premenopausal breast cancers in the combined cohort. And cancer is like deaths. We can get it on all the participants, all the children. About 300 colorectal cancers and maybe 200 prostate cancers, but with the numbers going up. There are lots of hypotheses about things that might be relevant in childhood that haven't been tested that we will test. So that's the plans for the future. Um, 
we will know in, uh, we won't know, but we'll have our score for our grant from NHLBI in August, which is a month and a bit away. And uh, hopefully we'll be going on to do more of those as well as investigate very thoroughly the, the full data set when we get it for our current hypothesis. And that's the surprise. <laughs> Nikki said a surprise photo. And thank you, Dexter. I, I didn't know what it was going to be, actually. Dexter, in the time I've been here, has taken a number of photos, nice photos at various events. And each time I've said, oh, would you mind if I had one of those? And, Oh, yes, I'll get it to you. This is the first one I have ever seen. But thank you for uh, sending it. And I can, for those, probably some of you here can guess where it was. It was the Staff Away Day for NDWRH last year at Broughton Castle. And that was in an upstairs room. And uh, anyway, thank you, Dexter, and thank you, Nikki, for putting it on. Uh, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you.